We're at this really interesting time right now where we have to stop looking at nonprofit and for-profit separately. Hi everyone, it's Kara Golden from The Kara Golden Show, and I'm so excited to have my next guest here, who is a friend of mine and fellow founder and CEO of uh, an incredible few companies. Uh, anyway, this is Lily Cantor. Uh, welcome, Lily. So excited to have you here. Thank you for uh, having me. I'm going to tell everybody a little bit about you, but uh, Lily is the current founder and CEO of an incredible company that she's going to talk to us about called Boone Supply. But prior to that, she was the co-founder of a company that I think you all have uh, slept in in these sheets and, and seen so many of the other products that they have called Serena and Lily. And uh, so cool that her name is is on this company. Incredible, incredible uh, brand and, and company that she built for sure. And I'm so excited just to have everybody listen to her journey and how she helped build uh, both of these companies, how she came from different industries uh, to really shed light on on what was needed in these uh, in these other industries and categories. And she spent 17 years in different industries in technology and accounting and had worked for huge brands, including uh, Deloitte and Microsoft and IBM. I mean, amazing experience before she decided to actually hang a shingle and become an entrepreneur. And I'm so, so excited to have you here, Lily. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So let me start with uh, the question that I, I, I love asking people, where did it all begin for Lily? Who was Lily, little Lily? Like, who was she? Was she a, uh, was she a risk taker? Was she all the things that everybody thinks of in, in an entrepreneur? I, I definitely have been an entrepreneur since I was probably about first or second grade. I I actually had a roller rink in my basement. I, you know, I, what? <laughs> yeah, I did. And I charged the neighborhood kids to attend. And then I had a snack bar and then I even char <laughs> charged them for the snacks. And so this entrepreneurship journey absolutely oh started in first or second grade. How did you have a roller rink in your basement? You know, listen, I grew up in Kansas city. We had these <laughs> large basements. They were concrete floors. I mean, what else are you doing down there? And you know, That's it's like hysterical. <laughs> that is so funny. And how many kids would like come over and roller skate? This oh is gosh, hysterical. at least, you know, four to six, you know, the neighborhood kids. And um I absolutely was trying to monetize from the time I was pretty young. So yeah. Hence it, hence you getting into the finance world. So yes. you were knew knew about making money and how to monetize it. And did you have music and everything? Oh, absolutely. We had, you yeah. know, back in the day, a, a nice record player. And, you know, it was Saturday Night Fever times. So I am aging myself. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely went into accounting because I love accounting. It's just so logical. That is hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny. So you graduated, uh, you decided not to buy a roller rink and I, uh, you jumped right into the finance world. Tell me a little bit about that. You know, I, um, all the way through college, I was working as a bookkeeper for a men's clothing store. At the time, Kate Spade was there. We were roommates in college and we worked for this guy, Carter's Men's Clothing in Phoenix. And our other guy was Andy Spade from Partners in Spade. And of course, and, uh, Andy and Katie married after college. And I was the bookkeeper and I went to work for Touche Ross right out of, right out of school and, and did Coopers That's and Libran and Touche. Yeah. 
That so. is hysterical. I did not know this about you, actually. This is what's so fun because, you know, I went, I grew up in Arizona and I, I knew Carter's actually very well. It was on 44th and Camelback. Yeah. It was uh, just around the corner uh, from me. And I, I knew Andy uh, better than I knew actually Kate and knew Dave and, and yep. the whole, you know, crew because they all went to ASU. And yep. um, after, I guess, did Kate when when did she transfer to uh so she went to she went to KU right like her, early right. on yep. and then didn't she transfer she did yeah that's she, what her and Elise, that's what I remember yeah yeah it's so it's such a crazy crazy story see I've known you for a while and I never even knew that story about you that's that is a riot and so you graduated and you jumped into uh, you jumped into finance then at what point did you leave that so I was two years in and honestly I was bored to tears um I was like oh my gosh this is I I love accounting but I was bored in public accounting and one of my crazy entrepreneur clients um y- because you were in Phoenix you'll appreciate this story he owned Yellowfront the old um company Yellowfront oh and he built yeah. that yeah so he was one of my clients and He snatched me away to help him raise money to open up office products warehouse clubs. They were called the OP Club at the time. And Mm -hmm. we were like one of the very first office club, um, office max type of, you know, large warehouse office products clubs. And I helped Rudy open up 11 of these and I helped him raise the money. And I was like, I don't know, 23 years old at the time or and or maybe 24 and we literally rolled out 11 of these um warehouse clubs 20,000 square feet raised a lot of venture money and um we then sold the company to at the time it was Bismart and then Bismart rolled up to Office Max and I helped Rudy with that journey and then the venture guys took me over to another company that they were funding because I worked, you know, 23 hours a day, uh, you know, being young and, and very, um, ambitious. And so they brought me to another one of their companies, which was an IBM systems integrator. And so I helped them build that for five years, which allowed me to jump the aisle. Um, because when I was in public accounting, all I was doing was accounting. But when I helped Rudy roll out these office products, warehouse clubs, I was doing all the technology and all the point of sale and all the back office and all the systems integration. And so I jumped the aisle into tech at that time. And then so interesting. I kept putting one foot in front of the other. What was the biggest difference between being in kind of the accounting world versus the tech world? Um, you know, I mean, listen, it, it, Having the accounting background and and actually understanding what the end result needed to be when you were hooking up all Mm -hmm. these systems really helped, you know, I mean, the accounting really helped understand like the data uh, and the data architecture Mm -hmm. and what needed to happen with the data and how to, you know, um, the end result being, you know, the financial statement, um, you kind of know how to go out and collect all that data from whatever source. So I think it's a very logical path to move into kind of systems integration. And um, that's kind of the path I ended up on was in the area of systems integration and helping retailers specifically implement systems. And so that's what led me back. Yeah. So it led me back to Deloitte and Touche and I went to go manage their retail technology practice in Los Angeles. And, and then I was recruited to Microsoft to run their retail technology vertical for the Western US in 1994. They were starting to scale the enterprise um, with SQL Server and Windows NT, and they needed someone that understood retail, uh, retail vertical. So that's what I, you know, one train door opened and got off on that platform and Another train arrived and got on that train. So, yeah, a so, lot of um, so interesting. <laughs> and, and and so then you so how did it was Serena and Lily next then? Well, there was a few things in between, right? So I um, let's see, I I left Microsoft to have my first baby, and I decided to not go back to corporate America. 
after having my first baby, the last thing I wanted to do was jump on a plane and go do a speaking engagement in Denver. Um, Mm -hmm. So I just decided that I'm done with corporate America. And I, you know, I took a year off. I had a baby. And then I opened a baby and kids store in downtown Mill Valley. And I, Mill Valley Baby and Kids, and I put my little baby Max in a stroller and I strolled him downtown and I got a cup of coffee and stuck the baby in a crib and just, you know, was doing my own thing. And just, I felt like the world didn't really have a great baby and kids store. So I opened one and, um, and that's when I met Serena. (laughs) And so, you know, did she work there or was she a customer? No, she, um, funny enough, I was off having a baby one day, um, at Marin General, baby number two, Zeke, Ezekiel. And Serena walked in the, my door to prospect. She had a beautiful decorative painting business and she painted nurseries and kids rooms. And she was also doing custom fabrics for interior designers. So she was honestly just bringing her portfolio over to show me that day, but I was having a a baby that day. Um, And so my manager, my store manager said, oh, Lily's going to love your work. She's having a baby today, Um, but I'll have her call you. And Serena's like, sure. Okay, whatever. And I, you know, I brought the baby in the next day. I think Zeke was all of 20 hours old. And I was doing show and tell, and I I literally took one look at Serena's designs and said, oh my God, they're gorgeous. I I picked up the phone and I called her and I was like, I love your work. And she's like, no, hold on a second. Aren't you the person that just had the baby yesterday? (laughs) (laughs) And I'm like, I love it. Oh yeah. Crazy as ever. So yes, she, she and I met a week later. And she came in and she showed me her portfolio of decorative painting. And I said, you know, why don't you paint that whole wall over there and I'll put out your cards and, you know, you can give me a rev share for your decorative painting. And then she showed me another portfolio, which was like kids artwork. And I said, I love it. I have a G clay art business. I was already selling artwork to 70 retailers across the nation And I said, I need some girls artwork. Can you do some girls artwork for me? And she's like, sure, why not? And then she opened up her third portfolio, which was these beautiful, beautiful patterns and beautiful fabric designs. And I said, you know, the world needs better baby bedding. Do you want to do some crib bedding together? And she's like, sure, why not? And she literally walked out of the store two hours later and she called her husband at the time. And she says, I think something really big just happened. (laughs) That is so funny. And so how did you guys, so that was the, so she was selling her product in your store Well, at the time. And then how did that become? She wasn't. We, she, she, no, because she was doing custom fabric for designers at the time. And so we decided to start Serena and Lily with just a line of crib bedding. And it was about 15 crib sets that we started with. And we're talking about 2004. Mm -hmm. And we did about 15 crib designs. Um, And we sent out, we produced a beautiful catalog that we sent to about 600 independent baby and kids stores that looked and felt just like Mill Valley baby and kids. And... um, the day that we, sh- the day we mailed our catalog, I'm, I'm not even making this up. The day we mailed our catalog, um, the company Wendy Bellissimo, yeah. which was the only crib bedding company out there, she decided to get out of the business. And so she faxed down and emailed all of her 800 stores across the country and said, thank you so much for your amazing business all these years. I now have four little girls and I really need to focus on them. And I've sold my brand to Babies R Us. And honestly, like she was the only crib bedding company out there. And it was, and she did that the day we, we sent our catalog to these 400, 600 stores. So, I mean, just talk about timing. We honestly like took her entire channel overnight because they had nothing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so we got opening orders from over a hundred stores the first two weeks that we sent our catalog. And we and we had a thousand dollar minimum opening order and it was all wholesale. We didn't have, you know, a shopping cart on our website. 
And all of a sudden we've got a hundred thousand dollars in orders and we had zero inventory oh at the gosh. time. You know, this was such a, you know, front end loading job. Like we just like printed this beautiful catalog, but had no inventory. Um, not only did we not have any inventory, we didn't even have a, a, a production company. We just had a cut and sew woman, you know, here, here in the Bay Area. <laughs> That's insane. I mean, oh, it's crazy, just crazy times. Yeah. Looking back on those times, we have many of those at Hint as well, where you're just like, you know, you're, you're flying the airplane as you're building it. You're, you know, hoping nobody finds anything <laughs> out. Like you're just like, oh my God. Right. You know, it's just, I, I know there's, those are always the best stories along the way. So how did you, so was it at that point that you kind of incorporated the company and made it Serena and Lily? Pretty much. I mean, I honestly think Serena and I to this day don't even have a partnership agreement that we ever inked. Um, I told her I would put $50,000 into the company and we'd be equal partners. And a million dollars later, I said, Serena, we got to get some like, you know, investors or something, you know, and um, we just did it. Like we just didn't really, I don't know, it was years till we kind of really structured it in a way that was like a real company. But I think it wasn't until 2007 did we take some friends and family um, capital. And uh, and then in 2008, we took some, you know, investment capital from an outside party. Um, so, yeah. So crazy. So interesting. What was kind of the, what was probably the most surprising thing about being an entrepreneur? Because I feel like you sort of took a step into being an entrepreneur just by opening a little store in Mill Valley, right? And you were sort of, you know, running it and doing your thing. But I mean, this was, this was like a bigger step. I mean, you just, yeah, I you know, mean, you listen, really, really went for it. We went for it. I mean, Serena and I, I think both have a personality type. It's like, go big or go home, you know? I think we um, manifested a vision that we were going to be Ralph Lauren one day. And I don't think we ever had any, um, you know, idea of doing something small. It's just not in our personality types. Yeah. You know, it was like, okay, we're going to, we're going to really go big with this. And um, it was, you know, neither one of us knew a damn thing about what the hell we were doing, but that was what made it like, that we would do it. I think had we known the details of this type of business, we would have never done it. Yeah, you know? I know. It's like you ask too many questions, you do too much research on it. And it's, uh, you, you instead just need to, you need to go. And, and, and I you, think that's, that's clear. Absolutely. I mean, I'll tell you, like, if you wrote a business plan on doing luxury crib bedding, that was $500 a crib set, you would not stop start that business. The addressable market mm -hmm. is so tiny. There's only 4 million births in the US every year. You know, what 1% of those can afford that? I mean, it, it, it this is just, you know, this business tops off at, you know, probably $4 million. And you just, mm -hmm. and so, but what was interesting about that is it, in that, it enabled us to build a brand because we really didn't have a competitor in the space. So we got mm -hmm. Jen Garner's nursery and we got Reese Witherspoon's and we got, you know, a lot of Hollywood stars nurseries that enabled us to get a lot of media and become kind of these designers to the stars. So it allowed us to build a brand in a place that didn't really have a competitor. And one always has to ask when there's not a competitor, is there no addressable market? And the answer was yes, there mm -hmm. it was no addressable market. And what even made it worse was when all the pediatricians started to come out and say, no crib bumpers. You're exactly right. I mean, when you're the only one in there, though, you know, you start to question, is this category, you know, big enough? Um, and in some ways, as I always say to people, like, I mean, in the case of Hint, we were we created a category called unsweetened flavored water. <laughs> and I thought I was, you know, genius because there was no one else here. But the challenge of that is, is that there's no one else to compare you to. Right. And so and is the category big enough? And I mean, we had buyers um, 
who were, uh, it's a different category, obviously, but for, in our case, I mean, we had, you know, buyers sort of hedging primarily because there was no one else there and they thought maybe consumers don't want it because there's no one else here. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, that was like, we had to wait for the consumer to catch up. Mm -hmm. Um, so a different, but there's some similarities in there as well. And, um, and obviously you branched out, beyond, um, you know, crib bedding. I mean, you're doing obviously baby's rooms and then entire homes. And I mean, your catalog is still to this day, just so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. It took many years to not be the baby brand. It took many years because the early adopters of the brand would literally be looking at the catalog. They'd be literally looking at a living room or a master bedroom. And they'd say, gosh, I sure wish I was still having a baby. I mean, it's amazing how strong brand impression is when someone adopts you when you're really early and you haven't done, you know, a larger play. Um, it took years um, to That's really, so yeah, it really did. So how did you, how did you branch out? Like, how did you, I mean, talk about, you know, having the courage and the fearlessness. How did you know it was the right time to go and launch these other rooms? You know, we kind of followed the customer, basically. You know, we first, we went from baby bedding. And in 2007, so we introduced our first crib line in 2004. And and when the babies started to go out of their cribs, in 2007, we started to do kids' rooms. And so our customer Mm -hmm. was asking us, you know, my baby's out of their crib, I want this you know, I want this look for their kids room. So then we introduced a whole line of, of kids rooms, bedding and, and other accessories for the kids room. And then from there in 2009, we started to doing adult because she's like, I want my baby's room is nicer than my room. I want my room to look like as well, you know, as the kids room. So we started to just go all in. And, you know, full tilt. <laughs> and that's, you know, when we really started to grow up was 2010, I'd say. So in terms of the master bedroom and the living room, that really started to come about in 2010, 2011, about 10 years ago. And then you did so. a beach. I remember in the Hamptons, you had yeah. a, a store. I remember when you launched that, I was like, yeah. what the heck? I mean, this is amazing. So that it was absolutely terrific. I mean, who opens their first store in the Hamptons? I mean, the Hamptons is a seasonal location. Um, and it was wildly successful because it was a coastal brand. And um you know, this customer is in fact coming out there all year round, except for maybe February. Um, although this COVID mm-hmm. year was crazy town in, in coastal communities. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it was, it was absolutely terrific. So you stayed on as uh, the CEO until, do I have the dates right? 2015? Is that when you I, stepped into the chairman or are well, you on the board? Yep. I, I stepped uh, out of the company at the end of 2015. So um, the new CEO came in in January 2016. And I, um, you know, I, I definitely, it was time for a break of running a marathon in a sprint speed um, for 12 years. Pretty, pretty exhausting. Yeah. You did an absolutely amazing, amazing job. I mean, yeah. it's just uh, like you've built a brand that you know, has, has really stuck. Right. And yeah. I think it's, it's one that is still, I, I want to open up the catalog. I want it, you know, I, I want to have those sheets on the bed. I want to have the different items in my home. I mean, it's just, it's absolutely beautiful. So you should be so, so proud. Thank of you what so you did. much. Thank you. Yeah. You know, yeah. we worked really hard yeah. and we are proud and we built it to last. Um, you know, what goes up, fast comes down fast. We, you know, we were considered the slow grower in the Valley. Um, and we, you know, really, I feel like sometimes the tortoise does win the race, um, because it was built with a lot of soul. Uh, and you know, really, no, I absolutely loved it. And are you still a board member? No, no. Um, we're both out. We're both out at this point. And, um, you know, it was time, it was time for a new, um, type of leadership. It was time for, you know, for us to 
kind of move on. Serena's got a beautiful line of fabrics and a beautiful line of wallpapers that she's doing for interior designers. And it was time for me to do something new. That's and great. so, yeah. That's great. And yeah. so the new, then you yeah. decided to launch Boon Supply. Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. So, you know, I had this dream back in 2008. I was sitting in the Crown Fellowship Program um, with this fabulous woman, Tamsin, who was part of the early, early employees and early uh, creative strategy people for the Red Initiative with Bono and, and Bobby Shriver. And, mm -hmm. you know, they raised $220 million for the Global Fund for AIDS um, in two years. And so I was like, God, you know, commerce and shopping is a very, very powerful engine to fuel nonprofit revenue needs. Um, and, you know, I, I've always wanted to create a commerce engine that spun off some piece of um, capital towards nonprofit, but how great would it be to democratize that and allow the customer to decide where that fund, where those funds go. And so after taking a year off from Serena and Lily and leaving there, um, at the end of 2017, I acquired the assets of an existing school fundraising company that was already in 7,000 schools across the U.S., and they had given back $75 million. Mm -hmm. And, you know, honestly, the industry has been frozen cookie dough, gift wrap, and chocolate bars for 100 years. And so, so I, yeah. I mean, like, come on, somebody hasn't disrupted this business with a digital platform and with great conscious product. And so I saw a huge opportunity to disrupt, but also, you know, since we, since we relaunched in 2018 as Boone Supply with all eco products and, you know, waste-free lunch and waste-free kitchen, um, we've given back $26 million for schools across America. And That's amazing. Yeah, it's a powerful, you know, unfortunately, when COVID hit last year, you know, March of 2020, our business flatlined. I mean, schools shut and our business went to honestly zero. I mean, it looks our Shopify, you know, analytics look like the patient died. I mean, it just mm -hmm. went flatlined. So it was, a, it was tough. It was a tough year because we were 100% in schools and, and sports teams. And so... I have a rock star of a, of a chief revenue officer, and she went out to Tori Johnson on Good Morning America, and we were able to do just under a million dollars in a day with, with Tori and really like our inventory, um, you know, produce some cash flow. Um, and with the help of PPP and, and some reductions, we were able to really save the company. And uh, wow. we really built a lot of third-party partnerships um, last year. And so we're just getting back on our feet. And we, it gave us the opportunity to rebuild the platform as a marketplace. So we're now we're opening it up to all these partners. Um, and we're really excited about the future of Boone Market. Um, and so, yeah. So basically people are, you've got items on there and then there's a percentage in the sales going back to, into schools. That's right. That's right. And sports teams. And are you, what do you think you learned from COVID? I mean, it, like, I think that that's the thing that I always share with people when you go through challenging times or, you know, failures or whatever. What, what is it that you learn that if you, if you would have known you would have done differently? Well, I mean, obviously this one's really obvious, but just the channel concentration, right? We had a hundred percent channel mm -hmm. concentration in schools and sports teams. Who would have ever thunk that schools and sports teams would have closed down? Like who would have thunk any yeah. of this would have ever closed down? But, you know, there was so much channel concentration in what we were doing. But I mean, listen, there was a gift for us, the gift of COVID, which was it allowed us to rip the band-aid off. We were still 50% on paper forms, which we've been trying to get off of. But, you know, listen, legacy uh, businesses and um, old fashioned types of businesses like school fundraising, they're very slow to, to change. You know, people just don't change mm -hmm. behavior overnight. So it, it was a huge gift and it was a huge opportunity to just say, hey, we're going to rip the bandaid off. And there is no paper forms. Nobody's going door to door here. <laughs> it's like you either have to no. di digitize this experience or you're dead. 
So, yeah, I think definitely you're right. I mean, it it just changed things significantly. And I also heard you talk about in an interview about your legacy product project of reimagining capitalism. Do you want to share a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I think we're at this really interesting time right now where we have to stop looking at nonprofit and for profit separately. We have to find ways to incorporate impact into the future of capitalism. Um, I think it's imperative. And I think we're actually, um, I think they're ab- absolutely going to be the next unicorns are the companies that figure out how to have tremendous impact using a capitalistic model. Um, we're yeah. at a existential crisis with the planet right now where we, you know, we've got a lot of inequity and we've got to figure out how to use this incredible engine of capitalism to reshape um, the world's, you know, biggest issues. So I feel very passionate about that. And I'm absolutely you know, out to prove that you can, in fact, uh, run a very successful capitalistic company, but also be able to share some of that with nonprofits. And, um, you know, we're really, really focused on carbon neutral right now. That That, that is absolutely our 100% focus is to build a marketplace of carbon neutral. Um, and so, That is, you know, it's a goal. It's good to have goals. Definitely good to have goals. So that's awesome, though. That's that's so great to hear. So obviously, you've been you're a serial entrepreneur, and you have you know three kids. Uh, What what advice would you give to them? And and sort of thinking about a career, you've worked obviously in tech and uh, finance, and and been an entrepreneur and a couple of different industries as well. What what have you learned? What would you, what, what words of wisdom would you share with them? Well, you know, for me, it's, I've always tried to encourage my kids to find their passion and, and, and have that passion lead to their purpose of, of, you know, their life purpose and, um, you know, creativity, you know, entrepreneurship to me personally is like creativity of the soul. Um, it's what it's, it's how I jump out of bed is that create that spark of creativity. And so I've always encouraged my kids and I really tried to, you know, show them the world and show them other interesting entrepreneurs. And, um, I just feel like they need to, um, find their passion and leave the world in a better place. And, and when they can marry those two together, you know, they've found their purpose. So. I just, you know, I'm very passionate about helping them find that journey. Um, and, you know, they're super young still, but my, my oldest is very passionate about the refugee crisis. He's very passionate about food sustainability and, and social justice. And so we'll see where that leads. I love it. That's, that's such, such great thoughts about that. But I, I really think, uh, you know, more and more, especially if nothing, uh, it, if if nothing great came out of the pandemic, I think more and more people are kind of rethinking things and also rethinking things for their, you know, their kids, too. And, and sort of what do you hope that they'll do based on, you know, any challenges that they see out there? So definitely love um, those words of wisdom. So uh, just one one last question um, for you. It's a it's a really, really tough one. But where can people find out more about uh, Lily and everything that she's up to? Oh, thank you. Um, well, I am, un- yeah. I, you know, I, I'm not very active on social media. I'll be honest with you about that. I am you know, very focused on the, you know, in-person uh, relationships, which I love and I'm passionate about um, spending a lot of time with people. But, um, you know, as far as the company, uh, boonmarket.com is is what I'm working on these days. I do post from time to time on LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not a private person. I just don't really engage um, all that much with social. Well, you are just 
so incredibly smart <laughs> and there's so much that people can learn from you. So I, I, uh, I you. always ask people, um, you know, Thank where you. can they learn more? And obviously, uh, Boone is so that the website address is for Boone. Is it Boone uh, Supply or Boone? It's Market both. Place? But right now, Boone Market uh, is where we're really taking the brand. Uh, we're building out this marketplace. Boone Market. Of good. Okay. Yeah. Good for you. Good for the planet. Good That's for fun. schools. I love it. So great. Well, thank you so much, Lily. And thanks everybody for listening. And uh, please give Lily's episode five stars and download and uh, the, and subscribe to our uh, great podcast. We are every week, every Monday and Wednesday now, we're having founders and CEOs and just incredible people with lots of great insights. And uh, hopefully you'll all uh, be back to listen to more. And uh, thank you again, Lily. I really appreciate it. I um, also want to remind everybody, if you haven't read my book yet that came out last October, I would... um, I would encourage you to do so. There's a whole entrepreneurial journey there that is laid out and uh, warts and all. And uh, so definitely would would love for you to let me know what you think once you get a chance to read it. And thanks again, everybody. Have a great rest of the week. 